Father, thank you so much for blessing us with another day to be your children, adopted into your family, declared righteous in your sight, with your commitment to us to be for us and with us until we get home. Oh, thank you for this, Lord, so that when trials and difficulties come, we can have hope, overwhelming hope. Lord, thank you for um, being with us in the many difficulties that each of us confronts all the time in this fallen world. Lord, I, I realize that each of us has many different things on our plates that could distract and detract and bring despair. And so I pray, Lord, that you'd make us hopeful and eager to hear from you. Thank you for blessing us with each other, with this time together, and we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to continue to think about our context or our culture that we're doing theology in the midst of. We just started to talk about this last time. And we jumped into Hebrews 5 and began to discuss, remember, the difference between uh, being children, babes who have to live on a steady diet of milk, if you open your Bibles to Hebrews 5, and the mature who are able to eat meat and actually teach others, which is how we need to think. Here's what happens. We, we keep increasing in our immaturity and keep adapting and adjusting to it rather than calling us to grow up. And that's what the writer of the Hebrews is calling us to today. He says, by now you ought to be teachers of the word, but you still are in a steady diet of milk. And so he's calling us to, to grow up. You know, I'm on a panel discussion tonight talking about relationships. And Tim Yulhoff and I have this, this discussion all the time because he thinks um, we should get married later because we're not ready to get married earlier. And, and we disagree on that to some degree because uh, although I agree with him, we tend not to be mature enough to go into marriage. My solution is not get married later. My solution is grow up so you can get married now. <laughs> right? So, so you're not waiting till you're 30 and mature. Just take seriously the call to be mature now and, and not wait and, and extend adolescence well into our, our 30s. So, uh, we're being called to grow up here, remember? He had much to say about Melchizedek. That by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you, again, the basic principles of the oracle of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he's a child. But solid food is for the mature for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. We talked last time about the expressions, just be a good person and let me just love God, yes? And how those are simplistic if you don't provide some theological definitions for good and person and God and love. We talked about that last time, right? Okay. Uh, so this connection, this fundamental connection between belief and behavior and knowledge and love are vital for us. But as we think about the ways we've been influenced, we need to think about how we perceive God by, as Peter Berger uh, says, cognitive contamination. You're part of a culture and you absorb these cultural mores, these, these attitudes, these presuppositions. And there's no better summary of how your generation thinks about things than what I, I've, I've seen in Christian Smith's work uh, in his, his book, um, uh, goodness, uh, we'll get to it, I'll, I'll remember, it's actually at the bottom of this. He comes up with a term called moralistic therapeutic deism to describe how generally people think about God in our culture. I know of no better concise way to describe the basic assumptions about God and theological things than this, moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic as in theology and God, religion, it's all about being good. Be good boys and girls, that's what it's all about. And therapeutic, it's all about being happy. And deism, God exists, but he's not really involved in your daily life. And here are the basic tenets of moralistic therapeutic deism. 
point number one of moralistic therapeutic deism and this sociologist Christian Smith's work. He says, a God who exists, who created and ordered the world and watches over human life. That's a basic assumption most people have. You know the Christopher Hitchens of the world, these, these well-known atheists now, do not represent the mass majority of people in our, our culture. Most people believe in God. Most people have a basic belief in God. He's a God who exists, created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. The second basic assumption is God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible, and catch this, and by most world religions. Notice, if your religion gets reduced to being good, nice, and fair, then the Bible and all other world religions are basically the same. If you get it on an ethical plane, just a horizontal plane, you, you get this result. That the Bible, the Christian worldview, is, is like all other world religions. It's just about being nice people. Uh, the third major point, the central goal of life is to be happy and feel good about oneself. There, here's where the therapeutic comes in. That really, I go to church, I worship, I pray if I do those things uh, so that I'll be happy, so I'll have a sense of well-being. You notice how very human-centered and horizontal all of this is. Really, what does God have to do about it? Well, not too much, which is why it's deism. Uh, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. That tends to be how people relate to God. He, he doesn't get involved in my daily life until I'm in big trouble and then I either curse him or call out for help. That's when God comes into play, as when things go awry. Um, so, uh, moralistic therapeutic deism uh, is, is a basic assumption about life in Christian Smith's work. And this last one is, good people go to heaven when they die. Um, in his book, Soul Searching, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers, he, he interviewed 3,000 American teenagers back in 2004. And so it's you guys, basically, he was interviewing. And they just came out with another book called Souls in Transition that, that interviews those same people who are now your age and finds out what they think. And here are the basic assumptions. Now, when I read through these, I hope you realize, what did you notice about these ideas? Any observations on them? It's very self-focused. Yes. I can Good. Very self-focused, which plays in perfectly with an American consumer mentality, a marketing approach to things, a very narcissistic approach to even religion. Good. What else? Other observations? Yes. It's very, like, it's not going to offend anyone. Okay. So it's very easy going. Like, okay. Yeah, they're, they're so general that everybody's pretty much on board with this. It's not going to create many arguments. Good, Rob. What do you think? It's based on popular culture, not biblical interpretation. Okay. All right. You can see how these things sort of fit by just popular culture. And I hope as we read through them, you, you said, oh, yeah, this, this is how most people think. Good. Other observations? <coughs> Good, good, excellent. What does it mean to be good or nice or fair? Uh, starting to define these things really leads us to, to theology, right? And to start to draw lines and give definition and clarity so it doesn't stay so vague if you actually want to do this with any meaning. Other thoughts? Observations about these? Okay, good. And the vast majority of people in the world believe they're a good person. Yet, do you know the vast majority in the world think that people are generally rude and increasingly rude? Just who are all these rude people if, mo if, if most people think they're really good? Somebody's got to be rude if we have that perception in the world. So, so yeah, we have this, this assumption going on in our culture. Now, I think it's so important to look at these and see truth in each of them. And the best lies have a lot of truth in them. They're just incomplete truth, which leaves you incomplete and not God-centered and not oriented around what God would have us believe. So, you know, I've said to you before that I believe we have been sucked into this culture far more than we tend to realize. I just surveyed one of my classes this semester and found out how they're doing relative to students I surveyed in the past. And here's what we came up with. Um, I can remember. 
I asked, uh, can you name the Ten Commandments? It's gone down from a few years ago when I did the survey. Only 3% of my students can name all Ten Commandments. 3% of Biola students. Uh, less than half are meaningfully involved in their local church. 16% have shared the gospel at all in the last two years. 23% have never told anybody about Christ. Um, uh, 13% had a good definition of justification. 14% um, had a good definition of the gospel. When asked what's the story of the Bible about, it was about 9% that got a really good answer. The rest were very moralistic therapeutic deism in their approach. That the Bible's about having a good life. The Bible's about um, being everything God wants us to be. The Bible's about filling our, fulfilling our destiny. Which are all things Oprah wants to help you with every day. So, so we have caught the disease of MTD, you know, it's, it's infectious. MTD, moralistic therapeutic deism, is an infectious disease that you're going to catch. It's actually quite appropriate. It sounds like STD because I think STDs are the result of MTD. Right? Because when these things are so vague, it all boils down to, you know, what, how dare you tell me I can't sleep with whoever I want to? And it's amazing how often that's what the discussion boils down to. You know, we're most out of step, not in, even on the question of homosexuality with most people in our culture, but with the question of premarital sex. I mean, that's when people think Christians are whacked. Just so out of step and old fashioned. But there are these, these issues that arise that really call into question the legitimacy of our Christian view of things. And, and I believe we've been so, um, influenced by moralistic therapeutic deism that we can't even tell the difference. As a matter of fact, start asking the question, how is this preaching, how is this ministry, how is this philosophy, this approach to doing ministry, anything more than moralistic therapeutic deism? And I'm not talking about what it says in the vision statement, to the glory of God and for the name of Jesus and all that stuff. I'm saying when it actually cashes out, how do you do this? What's getting the focus? What's getting the attention? Is it just as human-centered consumer-oriented. I mean, I hear uh, approaches to ministry that are nothing more than for the gospel to be effective, it must be relevant, and to be relevant, it must be preached with skinny jeans. <laughs> and we've got to be as cool and hip and, and so-called relevant as anybody, and we can't even then have the biblical discernment to know the difference between light and dark, good and evil. And so we don't have the lens to see things from God's perspective. We don't have a commitment to truth to see things from God's perspective. And we approach relationship with him as if it's a God of deism, that he's not really involved, he doesn't really care, he's not really engaged. It's not really about an ability to glorify God with my life today in the way I live before him. It's just deism, just help me when I need it, but don't bother me otherwise. And so we've got this view of God in relationship with him that, that is so twisted. And so this relationship between knowledge and love is essential for us. Um, Jonathan, do you know Kendra? Yes. You do? Good. Jonathan, Kendra, you guys know each other? All right. S uh, Kendra, say Jonathan asks you on a date, right? And he's really creative. So he takes you to Starbucks on the date, All right? And he pays for your $10 cup of Frappuccino, whatever stuff. And you're having a conversation with, with Jonathan, and uh, you say, you know, I really like this guy. I've known him a little while. I like him. I think, I think I'm going to open up. I think I'm going to share who I am. And you start telling him your loves, your hates, things that make you want to tackle the world, things that make you want to never get out of bed, things, disappointments in your life, goals, dreams, aspirations, and mid-sentence, he cuts you off and he says this, Kendra, I've really grown fond of you and, and I want to have a relationship where we love each other well as brother and sister in Christ, but also maybe in this budding relationship. And so for me, that means that it happens very naturally. 
and, and very uh, from the heart. And uh, there's something organic about it and so authentic about it. And to be honest with you, all these details about yourself, they're making things really complicated. And it's, it's getting harder and harder for me to love you sort of authentically from the gut because you just keep <laughs> piling on all this information, you know? You can barely keep up with it. So could we just dispense with the Kendra seminar and just enjoy one another? How does it strike you, Kendra? Thanks for the coffee. Thanks for the coffee. <laughs> what does that mean, thanks for the coffee? There's, that's a loaded statement right there. That's way more than that. Right, so, so what, is, what do you mean thanks for the coffee? sharing and getting to know one, one another, I would want him to listen to it, you know, the things about me, but I'd also want to learn about him. Yeah, but he's saying he wants to love you. He really, he wants this authentic, from the gut kind of natural love that isn't bogged down with all these details about Kendra, you know, where you grew up and how many brothers and sisters, whatever, come on. <laughs> what? So you're not liking this. Is it likely you'll go out with Jonathan again? Probably. Probably not, right. He paid for the coffee. Doesn't matter. It's not, it's not changing your view. What if I were to tell you this, Kendra? He's sincere. He's not just blowing smoke. He's not just impatient. He really believes that this is the best kind of relationship to have. Is that going to change it for you? No. Why? Do any ladies want to help change Kendra's mind on this? <laughs> Jonathan, you do not want to see their faces, brother. <laughs> they are not happy with you right now. You know, they know it's just an illustration, but they're going to have a hard time liking you. you know? <laughs> they are. It's, I'm sorry to do this to you, but hey. Um, See, so yeah, why? What? I mean, seriously, what do women want, right? <laughs> what, what's wrong here? What, why do you all think Kendra's right to feel this way? What do you think, Bree? He was saying he doesn't want to get, like, would you use the word about details? Bogged down, Bogged complicated, down. overwhelmed, that's yes. That's how you get to know someone. Mm -hmm. And that's how you love them because you know so much about them. You know the way they like their coffee. Right. You know the way they, what temperature they like. So Even those little details, right? Never yeah. mind loves and hates and dreams and aspirations. Right down to the details that don't even necessarily have any real practical ramifications, right? So. Jonathan's saying, I want to love you, but don't confuse it with all the details. And you guys are saying, no, the love is in the details. The love is in the knowledge. You can't have one without the other. And so you're realizing, oh, there's a fundamental connection between love and knowledge. And we get that on a human level so well, don't we? But we think, you know, God's above that. God doesn't care about being known with knowledge and loved with knowledge. It's just, it's just vague. It's just, and, and the more sort of mystical and abstract and, and not bogged down by hard thinking it is, the more pure it is. No, we, we know that's not true on a human level, and it's, it's not true with God either. And so the more we want to love God, which I believe every one of you wants to love God, it's one of my favorite things about teaching your generation. I believe there is such an earnest desire to love God, but there is so often a lack of realization that knowledge and love are combined, that, that as knowledge increases, so is love. I mean, we could retitle this class, Good Loving 101. That's, that's what this class is about. Loving well, God and people. Because we want to know God, and so the greater our knowledge, the greater our capacity to love. Now that doesn't always necessarily happen. You can have a kind of knowledge that does not lead to love. That's not what we're talking about though. We want knowledge and love to be combined. We want, uh, say, devotion, uh, truth and devotion to go hand in hand. It's never either or. These are evil false dichotomies. To think, oh, I, I, I want engaged hearts, I want passionate hearts, and oh, I know you love passion, and I love that about you, but sometimes you're just passionate about passion. You know, passion is the bottom line in all of it. Well, you can be passionately stupid. You don't want that. You can be passionately evil. 
You know what? That passion's not enough. It needs to not just be zeal without knowledge, but zeal with knowledge. Now, we don't react in the other direction. And, and like the Bible says, these people honor me with their lips. They know all the right words, but their hearts are far from me. There's not devotion. But we want passionate devotion grounded in truth. These are not false dichotomies. And if we fall into moralistic therapeutic deism, we're not discerning the difference between truth and error. And so in your course pack, look at page two. This connection between knowledge and love, between pursuing the truth and loving God. If you want to love God, and you know, it does boil down to love God and love people. But with meaning and with knowledge and with a love for the truth that God teaches and embodies, Isaiah 65, calls God a God of truth. Page two of your course back. And in the land shall swear by the God of truth because the former troubles are forgotten and are hidden from my eyes. Listen to Romans 3. What if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar. But when you grow up in a democracy where truth is determined by majority vote, it's really hard to believe that. That if every person on the planet voted, all entirely agreed on something, and then God voted, they're all wrong, he's right. Let, let every man be, be a liar, and God's the true one. He's, always, he's the source of truth. It, truth is not determined by majority vote. And then Romans 15, 8. I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth. That's why he sent his son, representative of truth, to conform the promises made to the patriarchs. And then we get to the son. You want to love the God who's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Well, to love the son means to love the one who calls himself not just the way and the life, but the truth. He personifies truth. He embodies truth. And that's why no one comes to the Father except through him. Now listen to Ephesians 4. You did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. And God the Holy Spirit. He's called the Spirit of truth that goes out from the Father and testifies about the one who is the truth, Jesus. John 16, his, his Spirit is called the Spirit of truth. And what's one of his main jobs? He leads you into all truth. Do you see how absurd it is to talk about loving God without knowing God, without loving truth in that pursuit? That's why we love, as the great, commissions, uh, the great commandment says, love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you're not engaging your mind in your pursuit of knowing God, you're not really loving God. Biblically speaking. You're not fully, therefore, obeying the great commandment. And how about loving people? We do want to love people, but what does it mean to love people? It means we're intensely concerned that they understand truth. See, th guys, this is a huge gap. We reduce love to random acts of kindness and, and general, vague, compassionate acts. Where the Bible sees love and a desire that the, the beloved understand truth. As, as Hannah, you can't have one without the other. You don't really love people if you're not intensely concerned that they understand the truth and give their lives to the truth. But it's, we've got it reversed, don't we? If you actually want people to change their minds about the truth, you're bigoted, you're hateful, you're intolerant. But the Bible sees loving people and seeking to help them understand the truth and persuade them to think differently as wonderfully loving. Not bigoted and intolerant and mean. How dare you suggest that I should change my beliefs? That's unloving of you. Do you see how backwards that is biblically? Because we realize that the reason people go to hell, the reason they perish, is because they reject God's truth. Look at Romans 1. What do they do? In italics, they suppress the truth by their wickedness. Top of page three. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor give thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And what they do? They exchange the truth of God for a lie. 
and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator. So if you love people, you care that they stop suppressing truth and exchanging it for a lie. Look what 2 Thess says. It says people, in italics, uh, perish because they refuse to love the truth. And they've not believed the truth, but delighted in wickedness. So love and seeking understanding of truth in the people you love go hand in hand. We're saved and we're sanctified because we understand the truth. John 8, if you hold my teaching, Jesus said, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. See, truth is not something that imprisons you. It sets you free. Jesus prays for us in John 17. It says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And then listen to Romans 12. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And look at the causal connection. Then, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You don't even know His will until you have a conform, uh, and conforming to the pattern of God's ways, not the world's ways. And look at that phrase, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Moralistic therapeutic deism is the pattern of this world. It's the way people think. And you've had, as Peter Berger says, uh, cognitive contamination in moralistic therapeutic deism. And so you can sit and watch the Super Bowl and see ad after ad come by that objectify women and turn them into objects. And you say, that was a good one. Instead of hating what God hates, you're entertained. You applaud the creativity. You think it's funny. Because we get saturated with cultural values and cultural perspectives. And every time we cut away to a commercial and come back from a commercial, it's focused on a body part of a woman. And we don't even notice anymore. Or we notice for all the wrong reasons. And we get sucked into a way of thinking and a permissiveness because we've been conformed to the pattern of this world but we're told to pull out of that. We're told to pull out of a, a moralistic therapeutic deism that, no, sees everything differently now. We see the whole world differently. We, we don't care more about the Grammys than the gospel now. We don't care more about what's going on on American Idol than we do in the epistles, of what's going on in the epistles, which is how it is right now. I asked my students to... to Give me the main point of the book of Galatians, and none could. You know, I, I actually need to start doing the, the, the cultural relevance knowledge survey, too, to see how really it does compare. And you know how it would compare. Yet we talk about, oh, we're stuck in a biola bubble. We're so cloistered away from reality and from the culture and we're just old-fashioned and we need to be more relevant and, and be more aware of what's going on. You really think that's the problem? I don't, I don't think that's the problem. I, I don't think it's been possible to be cloistered away ever since the information age has dumped everything at our fingertips on our iPhone. Pornography at the Fingertips, anytime you want it. Oh, the Biola bubble, as if that's our problem. I mean, you guys are up with the latest trends the second they happen. So, so how in the world, and let me tell you something. When I think of the, the handful of people in my life, the leaders of my life who've really had a significant impact for the sake of the kingdom, do you know every one of them would be considered here culturally out of touch. You know, they, they don't know who the latest stars are. They're not even quite sure what kind of car they drive. They know it's blue and it works. 
but we think that to be successful Christians, we need to have this definition of relevance, which means we're just worldly and shallow. And what we want so much is for unbelievers to know we're really not that different than you. We're actually entertained by the same things you are, and, and we're not that different, and, and we're just as shallow. And we love trivial things just as much, and, and we get distracted just as much as you do, and we're consumed with the same irrelevant things from God's perspective that you are, so would you like us, please? Because we'll be happier if you like us. And we're not living for something distinct from the world. You know, this, this passage in Romans 12, do not conform any longer to the pattern. Of this. There's a pattern. And God's is very different. And how does this happen to you? How do you, how do you change? How do you be conformed? James 1.18, God chose to give birth to us through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So truth and love, relationship with God, go hand in hand. A primary responsibility then of the church is to know and preserve and defend the truth of God in its comprehensive understanding. Not just little snippets and sections that you memorized when you were eight, but an understanding of the whole counsel of God's word, a big picture that gives you a, an ability to watch a film and not get saturated with cultural values. You're discerning. You're discerning enough to read a really popular book and say, well, this is not how God thinks about things. Or this is how God thinks about things. And the only way you can do that is if you know how he thinks about things. With a biblical saturation that gives you biblical discernment. So you listen to music and you hear it like God does. I mean, what does it do to you when the number one song two summers ago was I Kissed a Girl and Liked It by Katy Perry? What, what does that do when you hear that over and over again? And the number one song this past summer was another Katy Perry song, California Girls, which has some lines in it that if you think they're okay, I'd like you to come over and explain them to my eight and ten-year-old daughters. I mean, I would like you to come over and look at some of the lyrics and help Caroline and Paige understand why Katy Perry and Snoop Dogg are singing about women that way. And interpret some of those phrases for my girls. Um, or do we just hear it and say, boy, that's a catchy song. What does it do to you to be bombarded all the time? with no cultural lens that come from Scripture to filter it all through. To hate what God hates, love what God loves. We're sitting ducks, guys. We are sitting ducks. Especially because we're self-deceived. We actually think we've got so much knowledge, all right, already. Look, your, your problem will never be you've got too much knowledge of God. You know, people used to think that you could lift weights too much like certain sports and women didn't want to lift weights because I don't want to be muscle bound. People know that's ridiculous now. You can never be too strong as an athlete, as a person, right? But when I was a kid, people like say, oh, don't lift weights too much if you're a baseball player. Everybody knows that's not true. Now, your problem will never be too much knowledge. It may be unapplied knowledge. Knowledge that isn't quickening devotion in you and worshiping you. You just be concerned about that. But the problem is too much knowledge. Is, is not too much knowledge. The problem is, is not working it out in your life. Saying, Lord, don't let me read a chapter in this theology on atonement without being moved to gratitude and worship. If you love people, you care about truth. Listen to 1 Timothy 3. If I delay you may know how one ought to believe in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. The job of the church, one of the fundamental jobs, is to support and uphold the truth of God. You know, but then we, then we write books interviewing Christians, uh, non-Christians, asking them how they think we're doing as Christians. And then we define ourselves accordingly and adapt to what they think we should be doing instead of what we are doing. It's sort of cool to do now. 
And, and I'm all for understanding how Christian and non-Christians think, but to say, how are we doing as Christians? Wouldn't it be good to ask beforehand, have you ever read the New Testament? So maybe you don't even have a clue what Christians are supposed to be about. Because I've never heard a non-Christian interviewed and asked, how do you, what do you think of Christians? How do you think Christians do? And have them say, well, I don't think they're doing a very good job because their scriptures say they're supposed to be the pillar and buttress of truth, yet they don't even know the Ten Commandments or proclaim that truth. So I don't think they're doing a very good job. No, what are they going to say? They're homophobic. They're bigots. They're intolerant. So I don't think they're doing a very good job because that's what Christians are supposed to be, kind, nice people. They're supposed to be moralistic, therapeutic deists, and they're not doing a good job with that. When actually we are doing a pretty good job with it. We are a pretty good moralistic, therapeutic deists, and so we just need to wake up. And please don't be discouraged. I hope you're not finding this discouraging, but inspiring and motivating and, and awakening to how things really are. A pillar and buttress of truth is what we're called to be. Look at Matthew 28. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. You know this, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we usually stop there. But look at the second half of the Great Commission. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Do you see the teaching element? Teach them to observe everything. Discipleship involves becoming... Uh, saturated with the scriptures, becoming someone who is acquainted with the things of God. And Paul aligns himself with this. And when he's leaving Ephesus and says goodbye to the Ephesian elders, he says, remember how I was when I was with you? That's how I want you to be. And one of the main ways is this, Acts 20, 27. I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. What he's up to, not just the bits that people like, the whole purpose of God, Ephesians 4. And as a result of being this way, what happens? We're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of trickery, uh, every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Do we have the ability to read a wildly popular book and say, this aligns with Scripture, this does not. This aligns with Scripture, this does too, this does not. Do we have the ability to do that? To watch films, listen to music, have conversations, and, and have a theological grid that gives us discernment. Oh, we desperately need this. I remember I had a, you know, books come out all the time, and, and it's hard not to get concerned about these books because do the people of God, is the question, have the ability to discern the error? That, you know, you've never read a book that has errors in it and lies in it and false teaching in it that gives you a warning about that in the preface. Warning, pages 17, 35 through 38, and uh, the, the last chapter are filled with exegetical errors and false teaching. You, you, you don't find that in books, do you? <laughs> no. They don't help you out in that way. You need to know that, though. You need to be able to find that out. So people publish book, Embraced by the Light. Just a new age book. Came out years ago. Lady talked about her near-death experience. She threw a bunch of G Jesus words in there, and Christians loved it. And read it. I remember I was in grad school, and one of my Hebrew profs came in all upset. <laughs> He's so upset about a call he just got. He said, a Time Magazine just called me. Wanted, I, wanted to know what I thought of the book Bible Code. You know, one of those books that finds Osama bin Laden's name in the Hebrew text by counting up the letters. You know what I'm talking about? It's kooky. I could find every one of your names in the Hebrew text if you gave me a computer to do it with. Uh, so, and he's all blustery. He said, I don't want to read this book, but I have to read it now. Because Time Magazine wants to know what I think about it because all these Christians are reading it and thinking it's so great and doing seminars on it. So, do we have the discernment to get on with the things that matter and that are true? instead of getting bogged down in the latest book that comes out that gets our attention, even though it's not a, a biblically grounded book. So we must know and love and live the truth of God. And you know, when it gets overwhelming, a, a great bottom line question that my first theology professor, Tim Phillips, taught me, he said, the bottom line question of theology, the ultimate question of theology is this, am I being obedient to Jesus today? So in light of what you learned today in class, in light of what you learned about the knowability and incomprehensibility of God, is my daily life right now today obedient to Jesus? Because after all, he said, if you love me, you'll obey me. All right, questions or comments? 
Yeah, there is no, no one harder in the whole world to proclaim truth to than your own family, hands down. There's an emotional connection there that gets your heart rate going and makes everything more um, difficult and emotional and relationally embedded. And so, really hard. But it means so embracing the truth yourself, which is fundamentally the glory of God in the face of Christ, that it overflows from you. You know, if you ask me about my favorite pizza, it's in New Haven, Connecticut. The best pizza in the world is in Worcester Street, New Haven, Connecticut. And I would talk to you about that with concern that you came to believe this. And if you were ever in New Haven, would hate yourself if you didn't go to Worcester Street and have Sally's or Pepe's Pizza. It's just true. And so that would just naturally come out. It wouldn't be something, oh, I gotta talk to her about pizza because she's asking what. No, it, it should be something that is so part of our lives that it naturally comes out. You know, if you spend a half hour with me and it never comes up that I'm married or that I love my wife, that's weird, is it not? Yet we think, no, to not be pushy, I'll suspend my relationship with God in my conversation. They'll sort of act like it's not true and then bring it in when I think the time's right. And, and so there's an artificiality and an unnaturalness to it. But, you know, more and more people have no problem saying to me, you must have juice plus. You have to, or, or else uh, you won't be healthy. Or, oh, karma, it's karma. I knew it is. It, you know, LeBron James is convinced that karma is responsible for Cleveland's horrible season. And he, he tweets about that, you know, and people say, oh, your horoscopes are aligning. It's, it, and have no problem sort of wanting me to understand this important truth about horoscopes or karma or, or juice plus. But, but I want to be so reserved about proclaiming truth and helping people understand the truth, realizing that, no, it's fundamental. If I love you, I'll, if you believe, if I know that penicillin is the only thing that will cure you of your disease, yet you think Smarties will do it, it would be very unloving for me to let you continue to think that, would it not? Yeah, we've got a far greater disease and sin, and we have the words of eternal life, we have the solution, so we shouldn't let people think spiritual smarties will take care of it for them. Or that's not loving at all. And even though most people don't see love connected to truth, we need to. And then winsomely, humbly uh, proclaim that and, and love people by helping them see the truth. And, you know, I've had, I've, a lot of us will tend to say, oh man, I came, came to Christ, uh, my high school friends, man, we used to party, and now I have a hard time going back. I was just talking to a guy a couple weeks ago about this here at Biola. He said, I don't know how to talk to my old friends without condemning them, without judging them. How do I do that? And I, you know, I'll usually say, well, just start with an apology. Saying, you know, I, I've been friends with you after I came to Christ for a while, and I've been holding out on who I really am. I know I wouldn't want you to do that with me, so I'm not going to do it with you, and I'm sorry about that. I haven't been a good friend. I haven't told you who I really am now, and, and I'm about Christ now. And everything's different. And that stuff we used to do together, I don't think it's funny anymore. And so, so to be honest and, and forthright, just like people increasingly are about all kinds of things, even their sexual exploits. You know, they want you to know how, how great strip clubs are. I worked with construction workers for years, and, and they were strip club evangelists. They were. They had no problem saying, come on, kid, what's wrong with you? Why don't you go to strip clubs with us? Were you afraid? And we're, this stuff is great. And I'm, we're so timid about the words of eternal life. It's just amazing. Does that help? Yeah, I guess I will. Yeah, then we need to, in a spirit-led, winsome, wise way, seek opportunities to continue to speak truth. They will, they will too, unless you just have an entirely shallow relationship. And that's what tends to happen. We just float along the surface, what's on sale at Stater Brothers, rather than meaningful life issues. And so to get good at talking about meaningful life issues where, where these kinds of things come up. And to just say, I love you, and, and therefore I want you to know the truth that, that I've come to know. And, and, and maybe this is a good time to talk about this. Let's talk about our attitude in this. So we become uh, aware that we as the church are the pillar and buttress of truth and we've got the truth of God and we apply ourselves to it and we're attentive to it. And as Tozer said in his article that you read, the most important thing about his man is what comes into his mind when he thinks about God. 
And the essence of idolatry, Tozer says, is the entertainment of thoughts of God that are unworthy for him. And so we get about kicking over idols in our thinking, unworthy thoughts of God, and we don't entertain him and make him at home in our minds. And we get after that and we grow. And you know what happens tragically? We get arrogant in the knowledge we have. And you talk about all of these potential ways to get so off track. So we have knowledge, we have understanding, we realize it's supposed to lead to love, but it leads to arrogance. And that's exactly what people expect of us. That we become quite arrogant in ourselves when we understand the truth. And we love being right, not righteousness. And we, we you know, the Bible says knowledge does what? Puffs up. So let's just talk about attitude in this. What does it mean for us to be confident with humility? Men and women of conviction with humility. Those two have got to go hand in hand because so often, you know what sophomore literally means? Wise fool. <laughs> Why do we call a sophomore a wise fool? Do you know? What is it about sophomores that deserves that title? They know a little bit, but they don't know everything. Okay, yeah, they never will know everything. It, they know, they've learned a lot, and, and I love how much you learn in your first couple years, but you've, you've learned a lot, but not enough to know how little you really know. Right, so you take Biology 110, and you say, man, I'm good at biology, I'm going to study biology, and then you start digging deeper, and you realize, oh, this is massive. I had no idea. I thought I'd nailed that class and had biology down. And I realized it was just a little incremental step I was taking. And so you, you, you're not at that point yet, though. And so sophomores are wise fools. They, they wax eloquent about everything, and they go home, and they're insufferable to their parents, telling them everything that they didn't know growing up. And, and they go to their little church in Northern California, like their hermeneutics cops sitting out there, you know, catching their pastor making hermeneutical uh, blunders saying, oh, I just can't believe this. Mom, Dad, you need to leave this church. This is ridiculous. This is proof texting if I've ever seen proof texting. And, 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 and you're just really hard to be with, right? Because you're so proud of all these words. And you use all these words, you know, that nobody knows. Well, in this pericope, it's clearly the case that this hermeneutical principle is leading us to an eschatological realization of inaugurated eschatology. At, Oh, you're not understanding any of this, are you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I got to go now, now that I've demonstrated how smart I am. Maybe I'll grace you with my presence some other time with all this massive knowledge I've acquired. <laughs> and no one wants to be with you, and you give Biola a really bad name. Jay, you with us? Jay. Don't make me, help, you help the brother out or else he's going to get a marker in the chest. Come on, Jay, hang with us, brother. Um, do whatever you need to. Stand him back, Jay, if you have to. All right. Um, what are we talking about? Before a REM cycle took over. Um, what's that? Oh, knowledge puffs up. Thank you, Marcelo. Yes, knowledge puffs up, and it also causes you to doze off at times. But... Um, <laughs> But knowledge puffs up, and don't let that happen. Fight that tendency. You all know that tendency, don't you? I remember I was sitting in a Rich, Mullard, Rich Mullins concert once a few. You guys know Rich Mullins? A few years ago, I was sitting at Rich Mullins concerts, and all these, literally, these sophomores sitting in front of me. And I knew them. I was teaching at this college, Christian college, and a Rich Mullins concert. And Rich Mullins referred to the painting, The Scream. You know that painting? This guy standing on a bridge, and his head's kind of blurry, and he's going like this. And, he was saying his life felt like that, you know. That's the only point he was trying to make from it. And that painting was actually stolen a few years ago. It's kind of funny. Imagine this painting going out of the museum. No, don't steal me. Uh, um, but they found it, and it's back in the museum in Sweden, from what I've heard. But uh, I'm so, so Rich Mullen says, my, fight, my, my life sometimes feels like uh, that painting, The Scream, that Van Gogh painted. And Van Gogh didn't paint it. it it's, Painted by a guy named Edvard Munch, his name is. Well, you should have seen these sophomores in front of me, appalled at this artistic faux pas. 
because it's not a Van Gogh. He just said it's a Van Gogh. And you should have seen the reaction. They were just appalled that he just got this wrong. And they kept looking for affirmation and recognition that they knew he was wrong. And they would be like, I, I know, Monk, I, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I know, yeah, oh! And they were, I thought one was gonna jump up and just burst out. It's not Van Gogh! Everyone, don't drive home tonight thinking it's a Van Gogh! It's not! It, and I just, I, I literally sat on my hands because I was so, so inclined to dope slap the guy in front of me. <laughs> and when he turned around and say, would you stop it? Do you see what you're becoming? It's very ugly. All of you, this whole row, listen to me. You are becoming something very ugly because of the knowledge you're gaining. Because you do realize that before you took art history last semester, you had no idea who painted it and never, never made any dis difference in your life whatsoever. So stop it. Do you see what you're becoming? A sophomore, a wise fool. It's ugly. Look at yourself, is what I wanted to say in the concert. But I didn't because I was sitting on my hands and my wife was looking at me, knowing that's what I wanted to do. So I didn't say anything, but I said, well, I will tell other people about this. <laughs> so they don't become like that, right? It's so ugly, isn't it? Oh, and I see it in myself. I see this inclination to want to think about ways to talk. So I just throw a little information out so people know that I know something they don't. Remember that Helmut Tielicke article you read? Pathology of the Young Theologian Conceit, I, said, I think Marcel referred to it one time. Remember in the back, back of your course pack that you read right the first week? He talks about this, doesn't he? The pathology of the young theologian's conceit, he calls it. And he says that theology makes the young theologian vain and so kindles in him something like a Gnostic pride, which means I have knowledge other people don't. The chief reason for this is that in us men, listen to this, truth and love are seldom combined. <gasps> You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, Jesus said. That's love. Yet we say, I will know the truth, and I will assert my superiority over others with it. And he goes on, doesn't he? Anyone who deals with truth, as we theologians certainly do, succumbs all too easily to the psychology of the possessor. But love is the opposite of the will to possess. It's self-giving. It boasteth not in itself, but humbleth itself. He says, in his reflective detachment, the theologian feels himself superior to those who in their own personal relationship to Christ pass over these big theological issues. And then at the bottom of 18, nobody would maintain that this dubious pleasure of the student had the least bit to do with Christian love for one's neighbor. The purpose of his action was not to impart some, to the man some understanding of what we theologians are driving at or lead him gently beyond the stage of his previous knowledge, but to render him helpless. Here, truth is employed as a means to personal triumph and at the same time as a means to kill, which is in the starkest possible contrast with love. But it's so typical of us, isn't it? Look, if, if you really understand the, the Christian view of things, we didn't invent this. We didn't come up with this. We were suppressing this truth and unrighteousness. We hated it until God in His grace intervened and took off the blinders and the inclination away from it and moved us toward it. It's all grace. It's all gift. And so there should be a humility in us that, that Christians are perceived as being arrogant in the truth. Well, sometimes this is going to happen because no matter how humble you are, claims to truth are going to sound arrogant to a, a, a culture that we live in. But, but the, the, there should never be basis for this claim in us. We should do everything we can to, to cultivate hearts of humility in the midst of solid conviction. I'm not talking about impressive displays of knowledge. Paul was saying, you know what, you Corinthians, you're, you're, you're dismissing me because I'm not that great a speaker. I'm not wowing you like those, Corinthians rhetor those Corinthian rhetoricians that, that are so impressive with their, their display and their communication abilities and their rhetoric. And I'm just, you know, I show up and I'm, I'm just not all that impressive. But that's not what it's about. It, it's about power and weakness. Realizing that, as Paul did, that if God didn't intervene, you'd still be heading to Damascus to kill Christians like Paul was. It's all grace. 
you don't know truth because you're so slick or you figured it out or, or you're just smarter than anybody else. God loves to choose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So, um, so cultivating hearts of humility will hopefully help with what people are expecting from us, which is being in love with our rightness in, instead of God and His truth. So, so the attitude in the midst of trying to bring truth into our relationships is, is so vital. In that we, we say that, we clearly articulate that, so there's no mistake in what we think. I mean, people think Christians think they're better than other people because they have the truth. And instead of realizing, no, Christians are the people who realize that, that we couldn't figure it out on our own, which is why we desperately needed God to, to teach us what was true. Okay. Questions or comments? Marie? Yeah, to kind of, you know, Right. But, boy, isn't it important then, if people think the effort to convert them is unloving, um, because the very idea of conversion is, is rude. But let's realize that if you believe all religions are basically th the same and that there is no need for conversion, you've been converted already to that belief. A conversion has happened. Y you have changed your thinking. You you've come to understand things in a particular way. You've been converted. The question is not, will we be converted? Will we, will we go through some sort of thinking transformation and adaptation? No, we, or we're all doing that. Let's just acknowledge that. And this very idea that it's, it's wrong to try to convert people is a kind of conversion. You've committed to that. And you're actually, in saying that, trying to convert me to your view. So let's not say you're trying to convert and you're not. No, they're trying to convert you to their view that it doesn't matter. And it's wrong to do that, and you're trying to convert them to the view, no, I think love and truth are, are related. And so I think it's important, first of all, to realize that everybody's trying to convert somebody all the time. Uh, even if that belief is that there's nothing to convert to, right? So we're all committed to something. And actually, the fact that they would be bothered by your efforts to convert shows they want to convert you. So let's not let some people say, well, you're trying to convert me. Well, in very saying that, and, and I would say, yes, please try to convert me. I don't want to believe in false, falsehood, untruth, lies. So if, if you think you've got truth, or if you really want to love me, you need to, you know, there was a Seinfeld episode a few years ago that was just amazing along these lines. Um, Elaine was dating this guy, and she borrowed his car, and there was a Christian radio station programmed on the, on the radio. And there were, I think, two of them. And so she says, hey, are you a Christian? And he said, yeah. And she said, oh, why didn't you ever tell me? Because that means you, you believe I'm going to hell. And he said, yeah. And she said, why didn't you ever tell me that? And he said, well, it's your problem, not mine. And she broke up with him because she said, I don't believe I'm going to hell, but if you do and you don't tell me, you don't care about me. Seinfeld gets it, right? <laughs> and, and so and we sort of get this, don't we? <laughs> and if we really believe the things we believe, then to ask me to not try to help you believe them, you might not like it, but don't say it's, it's rude of me. Actually, it's very loving of me. So, so it means yeah, convince me there's nothing worth living for right. and dying for and mm -hmm. being passionate about and committed to. Convince me there is no such thing as objective truth, especially in light of the fact that you really know there is, don't you? You know that rape is wrong whether we took a vote and decided it wasn't or not. You know there's objective truth. Everybody does. And, no, and nobody lives with relative truth as, as the operative thing. So, so it's kind of a sham. It, it's, it's, I, mean, I meet almost no one who will really follow relativism to its logical extreme in the way they think. No one. You know, and when, when they are trying to do that, I feel like just going, <laughs> Oh, you don't like that? Well, me and my local narrative, we've talked about it, and punching people in the nose unprovoked is actually okay. You're not buying it. Okay, I guess we have some objective truth here that you, you hold to in spite of the fact that I just told you my subculture thinks that's okay. No, come on, we, we have a sense, an intuitive sense that, that God has given us of right and wrong. Um, good, what else you wanna talk about, anything? 
Yeah, as long as they know the story well and evaluate us according to what, what it really means to be a Christian. Uh, that can be helpful. And I think to some degree they can all be helpful, but we get these inferiority complexes because the world doesn't think we're very Christian. Do they know what it means to be a Christian? Because we struggle with knowing what it means. So I just, <laughs> just have a hard time with, with asking. No, I want to know, and I am interested in that, but it becomes this, this definition for us. And then our marching orders come from non-Christians' perceptions of us. And we have this evangelical self-loathing we've had for a long time. I mean, you know what? It's so cool in the church to say, we're so lame. Aren't we lame? Yeah, we're lame. <laughs> yeah, we, we deserve all the abuse. Oh, please make another movie to mock us, because, man, we deserve it. And it, we're just... <laughs> when, it, it, we just say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're lame. And so, um, you know, people set up booths, and they don't hear confessions. They give confessions. That's their outreach. You know, we're sorry for the Holocaust. We're sorry for Native Americans. We're sorry for... I mean, it, it just we're, we're, the church is taking responsibility for everything. And, and putting this self-loathing out there as, as what's authentic now. And so to say, no, we have truth, and people love to come back from mission trips and say, I learned more than I, than I taught. I got more than I gave, and I worked with all these non-Christian pagan people, and, and they taught me more than I taught them. And I feel like saying, hey, if that's the case, could I have the money we gave you back? Because that's not why we sent you. No, I'm happy you learned, but we wanted you to actually be a pillar and buttress of truth on your trip. We wanted you to make the place better because you were there and help people know God and proclaim Christ. But it's just not cool to say we made a difference. It's, it's cool to say we learned more than we, we taught. Well, really, is that why you went? I do. I, give me the money back. Not really. I wouldn't do it. Well, I might. I think about it. All right. Anything else? Questions or comments? I know. <laughs> I know, I just can't believe, and you know, my whole lifetime, the Valentine loathing is just growing. And Christians, I think, are the worst, because we still value marriage, right? And so we see this, this Valentine Day things leading to marriage. And so there's, a, but I'm just, come on, people. It's like, I hate Valentine's Day. It's ridiculous. It's, like, it's just a stupid holiday. And it's just impossible to be happy for anybody who's enjoying a relationship, right? Because we're just so maliciously envious. <laughs> what in the world? Goodness, yeah. Um, you guys should dive into your lives right now and love the privilege you have to study and not be distracted by Valentine's Day planning. Come on, you don't need that. You really don't. Certainly don't need it to be fulfilled or joyful or hopeful or have a sense of purpose and destiny in your life. Oh, I'm not minimizing the joys of those kinds of relationships, but goodness. Um, anyway, even if you did have somebody to spend Valentine's Day with, it's highly likely you're going to break up. <laughs> you do know that, right? It's true. It's just true statistically. I mean, you're, you're, it's highly likely you're not going to work in what you're majoring in, and it's highly likely you're going to break up with the guy you just spent Valentine's Day with. Just know it. So here's the goal. When you date, date so that when you do break up, you'll get invited to her wedding to some other guy. That's the goal. And they'll want you there, and he will too. And then at the reception, this is how you should date. At the reception... You date it in such a way where you saunter up to her new husband. You look him right in the eye and you say, you owe me. I did right by you, man. Your wife is more godly because she hung out with me and she's going to be a better wife to you because she spent time with me. You owe me. Give me that gift back. I deserve a gift. Right? <laughs> No, that's, that's a brother loving another brother, right? And then, and then walk up to her father and say the same thing. <laughs> I'm serious. And if they know, and, and she will have told them about you, and they would have said, you're right, I do, buddy. And it'll be beautiful. It'll be a beautiful moment at the reception. <laughs> I'm serious. You need to think about that when you're dating. And then do this. Look, if you're dating somebody else's future spouse right now, Somebody's dating your future spouse right now. 
So think about how do I want that brother to be treating my future wife? Oh, and that's how I need to be treating the sister. Oh, that kind of changes things a little bit, doesn't it? Yes. So let me pray. Father, would you help us uh, to, to be humble and, and to uh, learn to live for what lasts forever? Learn to live for your kingdom's advance and your glory displayed in this world and through our lives. How amazing, Lord, that you can glorify yourself through our, our little frailty. So, Lord, thank you for these dear students. What an encouragement they are to me and just the way they listen and are hungry and, and uh, how enjoyable it is to be together. And so, Lord, we are thankful to you and we do pray that you'd be working humility in our lives and making our little stories in, in our estimation part of your big story, Lord. Help us in these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.